Su Your Excellency, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, Madam Sara Baharaki, Global Youth Ambassador. Global Ambassador of the Third World and representative of the Major Group for Children and Youth. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, authorities, delegates, uh, youth leaders, friends, uh, I'm honored to welcome all of you to the Youth Forum for Equisoc 2024. This day, uh, young people from around the world have uh, coordinated, organized, and are meeting in order to think uh, globally about uh, the same concern, how to strengthen the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development uh, and to eradicate uh, a poverty at a time of multiple crises. We have uh, gotten used to hearing about crises as being a sort of condemnation, but now I'd like to begin with an invitation. Let's uh, look at crisis in another way. In this uh, forum, Global Youth has called upon us to change our discourse. Um, we will speak about the multiple crises as a question, uh, a problem, but above all, as a, an appeal for hope. In 1948, uh, the uh, Gabriel Mistral, the uh, Nobel Prize uh, laureate, uh, said to the young people of all the planet, and I quote, you are uh, coming uh, and giving us the impetus that we needed, uh, what we were lacking, end of quote. Um, uh, this uh, force is renewed today with your presence. We recognize uh, what is necessary for our time what you are requiring of us. Um, and uh, while the uh, time is running uh, at ECOSOC, we express our commitment to you and uh, our uh, faith in you. Uh, global Youth, um, we uh, understand your dreams for a better and more inclusive future for all. For centuries, uh, being a young person was a synonymous of change, uh, uh, progress in the future. You, the new generations, uh, have uh, uh, shown us that uh, being young uh, in the present day is also being responsible. The voice of youth um, has once again uh, adjusted our ethics uh, because let's uh, confess it, uh, uh, this anguish has led us to a, a pessimistic time which is no longer justifiable. The young people of the world are asking uh, us uh, about our responsibility for peace in the world and the ecological balance. Uh, your enthusiasm and determination are crucial uh, for the success uh, uh, designed to uh, tackle the global challenges and to build uh, a, a world which is more just and more sustainable. Uh, uh, your ideals, ideals are the music of a humankind which is not giving up hope. Um, hope that better days will come. For decades, uh, uh, the young people have accompanied the United Nations. Uh, they have uh, nourished us with uh, their endless imagination uh, that looks at the world with uh, surprise of what uh, we can imagine, uh, the joy but also the pain of others. Uh, uh, Sixty years ago, um, the uh, Declaration on the Promotion of uh, Youth um, and Mutual Comprehension uh, Among Peoples uh, said that after the war, the young people were the ones who most uh, suffered and who had the greatest number of victims. The same uh, statement uh, proclaimed uh, that the education of uh, young people as well as the ideas uh, in a spirit of uh, peace and mutual respect and understanding among peoples uh, could contribute to improve international relations uh, and to strengthen peace and security. And here we see the paradox. Uh, those who suffered the greatest violence are the ones uh, who are bringing us the greatest uh, hope to overcome it. Uh, your presence here in this forum is uh, uh, proof uh, that this uh, promise is being complied with, uh, uh, with the uh, shadow of a global reactivation with armed conflict. Uh, and you once again represent an opp opportunity for peace uh, and the spirit of cooperation and multilateralism. Our uh, uh, youth forum, and I say our youth forum, uh, sustains uh, that uh, the young people of the world uh, also have uh, 
a greater opportunity for equality. In the next uh, three days, uh, the ambitious uh, agenda, our uh, roadmap uh, will be discussed uh, and the impact uh, of the SDGs, uh, one, uh, poverty, uh, two, uh, zero hunger, and uh, three, action for climate, uh, uh, 16, peace and solid institutions, and uh, 17, uh, an alliance uh, for the achievement of the uh, objectives. Uh, all of these will be reviewed in the uh, high-level political forum in July. Uh, once again, young people, uh, goes uh, beyond the pace of history. And uh, these uh, goals are fundamental in our fight against uh, poverty, which uh, increasingly is getting tougher. And today, only a third of the countries are, are on the path uh, to uh, reducing their levels of poverty for uh, 2030. 7% uh, of the uh, global population, uh, 570 million people, are uh, suffering uh, extreme poverty. Uh, once again, among those who suffer the most, uh, are the young people who are a significant part uh, of the global uh, population affected by poverty. Uh, where we must find opportunities, we see barriers to have access to education and to decent employment, uh, as well as economic opportunities. Uh, 586 million of 1.1 uh, billion uh, poor people uh, in the world are under the age of 18, and they are uh, fighting against uh, inadequate infrastructure to break the intergenerational cycle of uh, inequality. We know that poverty seriously limits uh, the prospects for development among young people, uh, thus perpetuating the cycle. We have to do more for our young people. A part of the response is including them in the public decisions. Uh, changes in legislation do not uh, adequately reflect uh, the concerns uh, directed towards young people, namely uh, due to the uh, lack of uh, representation of young people in uh, the national uh, decision-making processes. Uh, this forum is an international effort to, to give a, a voice to that necessary representation. When we talk about young people, along with the political uh, challenges, uh, there is also the educational challenge. The uh, young people of the world have to uh, develop themselves and become educated to face challenges that we have never faced before. Um, uh, we have spent decades preparing ourselves for an interconnected world linked to the uh, dreams of technology. Today, as a learning a compass of 2030 pointed out, we have to prepare the young people uh, to tackle an interdependent world that includes their uh, uh, training and education in global citizenship. And it's in uh, this sense uh, that your experience, uh, young people of the world, is essential because you're the ones uh, who uh, best understand the new uh, requirements of creating value, taking responsibility, and uh, focusing on the uh, dilemmas that we find in politics as well as in the new uh, global uh, dynamic of the labor market. You have taken uh, technology and you have humanized it once again. I can uh, testify to your ambition uh, and your commitment uh, to use the digital world to project your voices, to build networks, and to generate tangible impacts, which would make it possible to imagine a better world. Uh, colleagues, uh, friends, usually uh, we talk about the leaders of tomorrow, but you are the uh, leaders of today, of the present. Uh, uh, from the uh, ECOSOC Youth Forum, you can play an active role with member states, uh, uh, UN entities, and other uh, visionary young people uh, to trace the path and to make take a concrete action in order to uh, direct us towards sustainable development. Uh, here, your ideas and your contributions are not only heated, but they're also the motor of uh, transformation that our world needs. I'd like to point out along these lines uh, that uh, the uh, Youth Forum will focus on the Summit of the Future, uh, an important intergovernmental agreement uh, that aims to uh, strengthen international cooperation, solidarity, and uh, uh, the effectiveness uh, of the response to new threats and opportunities, uh, as well as to accelerate uh, the implementation of our uh, Agenda 2030. Your contributions and your uh, enthusiasm and boldness are fundamental in this process. And uh, today, of uh, many hopes, ECOSOC invites you, uh, without exclusion, uh, to uh, claim the voice uh, that you deserve uh, and uh, to point out that young people are not a homogenous community, and hence we have to promote uh, the diversity of the voices. Uh, the youth participation uh, should be valued in different contexts, uh, having uh, substantive participation for women, uh, girls, indigenous persons, uh, rural workers, uh, uh, persons with disabilities, LGBTQ plus people, uh, cultural and ethnic minorities, uh, as well as uh, religious minorities. Uh, they share and bring together their ideas. Um, 
they inspire themselves and inspire the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm awaiting your participatory conversations in the next three days. Um, this uh, uh, space belongs to you. Thank you very much. I now invite the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, to address the forum. Dear friends, welcome to the ECOSOCUS Forum and thank you for your presence and your engagement. The energy and conviction of young people are infectious and more vital than ever. Our world is bristling with challenges, tragedies and injustices, many of them linked. The Sustainable Development Goals are way off track. This means children hungry, families trapped in poverty, and young people out of school. The climate crisis is spiraling downward as emissions continue to rise and the fossil fuel industry, in its immense greed, tries to block change at every turn. Great rifts within and between countries are fueling mistrust and eroding solidarity. Inequality and poverty are rife. Polarization and hate are spreading, stoked by digital transformation and division. Human rights are under attack and conflicts are raging around the world. Israel's military operations in Gaza following the devastating terror attacks by Hamas on 7 October, are having an appalling impact on civilians, including young people. Thousands of children have been killed. Thousands more have lost one or both parents. And 100% of young people in Gaza, every single child, is out of school. It is high time for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire the unconditional release of all hostages, the protection of civilians, and the unimpeded delivery of humanitarian aid. Dear friends, in the face of all these crises, public trust is plummeting, alienation is growing, and the international system is cracking. The future of multilateralism is at stake. And so we need action and we need justice. And I salute young people around the world for standing up, speaking out, and working for real change. We need you. I'm fully committed to bringing young people into political decision-making, not just listening to your views, but acting on them. We established a new youth office in the United Nations to advance advocacy, coordination, participation, and accountability for and with young people. We will renew the United Nations Youth Strategy to take this work to the next level. And I'm committed to making sure young people have a strong role as we gear up for the Summit of the Future in September. That includes this forum's discussion, virtual consultations on the Pact for the Future, which will include a chapter on youth and future generations, and your work mobilizing in your communities. We are also holding a youth-led action day at the, as the summit begins, so that your voices are heard from the start. We are... <laughs> Dear friends, the summit of the future is a pivotal moment to turbocharge the SDGs and reinvigorate multilateralism. We have already put forward a number of concrete ideas on strengthening youth engagement for member states to consider. This includes establishing national youth consultative bodies, a global standard for meaningful youth engagement in decision making, and creating a UN youth town hall. We are also working to advance a global digital compact to help build a world where digital technologies support sustainable development, including education and jobs for young people. A world where children and young people are protected online, benefit from digital technologies, and have a say in the decisions shaping digital life. We have created a high-level advisory body on artificial intelligence 
to make recommendations on international governance of AI. This group of experts is gender balanced. It includes young leaders and people from the Global South, and it is feeding into the Global Digital Compact. We have also proposed a new agenda for peace, to renew and strengthen multilateral security frameworks, and to embed young people's participation in peace and security institutions that are funded in full. As we are pushing for reform of the United Nations Security Council and the fundamental overall of the international financial architecture, we count on youth engagement and leadership. Many of today's developing countries have no voice when those institutions were established eight decades ago. These systems were designed by the rich and remain controlled by the rich and are failing in some of their most basic functions. We must shake off the relics of the past and create institutions that reflect the world today and serve its needs. This is a matter of justice. Dear friends, I urge all member states to get behind our proposals, and I ask young people to join forces with allies and partners across civil society to demand that governments make the summit count. You can start by supporting the summit of the future digital campaigns we are launching today. Take on the Act Now Challenge and share it with your networks to show leaders how many of us demand a sustainable future for all. And sign the open letter to world leaders on reviving multilateralism, launched today by the United Nations Youth Office. Beyond the summit of the future, I salute young people for being on the front lines for bold climate action. Our climate is in meltdown, and the poorest are paying the price. This is breathtaking injustice and a terrible betrayal of your generation. Governments need to adopt strong policies to accelerate the global phase-out of fossil fuels and the just transition to clean energy. And they need to create new national climate plans by 2025 that align with 1.5 degrees Celsius limit. And they need to bring young people into this work meaningfully. The transition to renewables must be just, and it must be sustainable. And we will soon launch our panel on critical energy transition minerals to help to ensure developing countries benefit fully from this transition. My youth advisory group on climate change will have a seat on this panel and will help to engage young people in its work. Developed countries must also keep their promises on climate finance and governments must make generous contributions to the new loss and damage fund as a step towards climate justice. And we must all push to get finance flowing to sustainable development more broadly to turbocharge the sustainable development goals. That includes countries backing and implementing our plans for an SDG stimulus and supporting deep reforms to the multilateral development banks. Dear friends, every generation serves as caretaker of this world. Let's be honest, mine has been careless with that responsibility. But yours gives me hope. The United Nations stands with you, and together let's deliver justice, let's deliver solutions, and let's create a world of peace and prosperity for all, and I thank you. I thank, um, I warmly thank the Secretary General for joining us uh, this morning and for his statement. I now invite uh, Ms. Sarah Baharaki, Global Youth Ambassador of uh, Their World and representative of the major group for children and youth, uh, to deliver a statement. Uh, Ms. Baharaki, you have the floor. Mrs. President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, and my friends. Salon. Behind every story coming from conflicted zones, it is resilient youth bearing the heaviest 
burden. Their dreams shattered, their rights trampled, and their future obscured by the shadows of uncertainty. Let me paint a vivid picture with the story of Arya, a symbol of courage amidst adversity. Arya, an Afghan woman, has lived under the Taliban regime twice in her life. As a young girl with unattained dreams, and as a mom witnessing the same fate for her daughter. She was just 14 years old when the Taliban first took over Afghanistan in 1996. They closed her school doors and she was left with all those dreams. Due to the financial hardship her family was facing, she was forced into marriage at that young age. But did she give up? The answer is no, she did not. But she waited for the right time. She did not give up and waited for the right time. So when the Taliban regime collapsed in 2001, and the international community's intervention provided a safer environment for women, she resumed her studies. She finished her school, obtained a university degree, and sustained a job. All was going good until the life played its part again. And sadly, she lost her husband to an explosion in 2020. She became the only breadwinner for the family, playing both a role of a mom and a dad. But she was doing it perfectly, supporting her children both financially and morally, until the story repeats, when the Taliban takes over Afghanistan again in 2021. Thousands fled, their, fled the country to save their lives, including myself, and millions of others stayed and hope that the Taliban might have changed. But this remained only a hope. The Taliban once again closed the school doors on girls. Thousands, one of thousands was Arya's daughter and banned women from working where Arya herself fell the victim. Although Arya's daughter is living the same faith her mother did, witnessing the closure of the school doors and others right, other girls' rights taken away from them. But the story is a bit different this time. Not the situation itself, but the way that young generation deals with the situation is different this time. This time, youth refuse to remain silent. They no longer wait for an army or another regime to fight for them. Instead, they take the matters in their, into their own hands. Both mother and daughter attend every protest organized by Afghan women, raising their voices and fearlessly advocating for their rights, together with thousands of other women. And they say, and I quote, as the number of bullets rises, our resilience rises higher. As the rec restrictions get tough, we get tougher. And as the explosions and the conflict goes high, our belief on our determination to never give up and fight for change goes higher. Although they both under a chaudhary, so-called burqa, in a queue of hundreds of other women outside bakeries, wait every day for a generous person to donate them a piece of bread. Unfortunately, this story, although is a story of one woman, but belongs to many. Under the chaudhary that every Afghan woman is forced to wear, there is an engineer, a lawyer, a teacher, many of whom are left with no choice but to beg for a piece of bread. Now it's the stories like this that makes us realize that we, if we are in safety, have a roof over our head, and enough food to get us through the day, clean water to drink, and opportunities to work and learn, then we are privileged. But many are not. Still over 575 million people are in extreme poverty, many millions are left homeless, 
thousands of girls are being forced to marriage at young ages every day, and youth are leaving their countries seeking refuge in other countries to save their lives or seeking for better opportunities, knowing the high level risk of losing their lives. Over two million girls are banned from attending the schools in Afghanistan, and millions of others are in state of uncertainty in Ukraine, Palestine, and Sudan, knowing that education is vital in reducing poverty, conflict, and climate crisis. Similarly, around 600 million people are estimated to face hunger in 2030. Millions of farmers and civilians will be affected and are being affected by the climate change and so far increasing inequalities are the clear signs addressing the urgency of the situation. Although we're just six years to 2030, but unfortunately there's not much progress made across the SDGs. The countdown starts. It is the time to act and make right decisions because we are running late. And by making the right decisions, we should know that it is only possible to do so by involving the ones mostly affected by the issues and the decision-making processes. As youth, and in fact, the most vulnerable group, we need more than just a seat at a conference or a table to write a decision or a microphone to raise our voices. We need support. We need the government and the private sectors and civil societies to support us at all levels by involving us in all levels of meaningful decision-making processes and support our initiatives. Not only because we make up to 16% of the world's population or because we are the most educated generation so far, but because we have power. The power to dream for a better world and the courage and bravery to work and make these dreams a reality. We have the power to inspire and innovate. We are fearless, fresh, open-minded, and unfamiliar with terms impossible, and most importantly, the future citizens of the world, the world that we are trying to save. For us, young generation, we do not wait for the right time. We create the right time to act and bring changes that we want to see in our societies. Meeting tens and thousands of other young leaders to collaborate from across the world, hearing their stories and hearing about their actions towards change, whether to shape the future of education or democracy or planet through their initiatives, small platforms and campaigns, I realize that us, for us youth, we do not define change as a mind-blowing moment that shapes humankind's history. For us, the change starts with every small steps we take and every small improvement we make. We believe that drop by drop, the ocean is filled. Now in this room, we are a mix, bringing different cultures, ideas, solutions, and we are here for one common goal, and it is to see a better world. A world where everyone lives in equality, every soul flourishes, a world where all human beings, regardless of their religion, race, and are given their rights, where no one is left with no food or less food to consume or clean water to drink, where no child has to go to work instead of going to school, and where poverty does not force youth to emigrate to other countries. A world where selfish decisions made by individuals and firms do not lead to climate crisis, taking everything from a poor farmer living in a rural area whose only source of income is their land and crops. And simply a world where no one is left behind. But to create this world, we must unite. We must not let the political borders divide us because our similarities are far more than our differences. It is the time for the whole world to come together and become one and work for our common goal of achieving a sustainable world. So dear change makers, I know we're all here for a story, to rewrite it, 
either for ourselves, for our communities, or for the world. So let's not forget that we are the writers for the new story, for the world and future generations, for your innovations, advocacy, and initiatives. Thank you. I thank the representative of uh, their world and representative of the major group for children and youth. Um, I would now uh, briefly pause the meeting to allow the Secretary General and other distinguished guests uh, to take their leave and for the podium to be rearranged for the conversation on youth for solutions and innovation. Once again, I'd like to thank the Secretary General and Ms. Uh, Ms. Baharaki for having joined us uh, this morning. Now, uh, after the uh, conversation that we will have today, I will uh, uh, deliver, uh, we will hear a welcoming speech from the uh, President of the uh, 78th Session of the General Assembly, His Excellency Dennis Francis. The forum will now, um, uh, friends, the forum will now hold a moderated conversation on uh, youth for solutions and innovation. And it is my pleasure to welcome the distinguished uh, speakers. Dr. Felipe Paulier, Assistant Secretary General for Youth Affairs of the United Nations. Welcome, Felipe. Uh, Ms. Umaima Makluk, Data Scientist at Intel and Data Focal Point of the Youth Science Policy Interface Platform of the major group for children and youth. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Terry Otieno, co-chair of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction Stakeholder Engagement Mechanism, and the global focal point in the working group on disaster risk reduction of the major group for children and youth. Ms. Uh, Narabene Farka Zainaba, 
telecom engineer and president of the Network of Sahelian Youth for Climate Mali and Youth for Climate Champion. And Ms. Justice Faith Betty, co-founder of the organization Revolutionaire. I also welcome Ms. Augusta Saraiva, economic reporter and United Nations correspondent for Bloomberg News, who will be the moderator of this interactive dialogue. And I now invite her to conduct the discussion. Thank you, Chair. Everyone. My name is Augusta Saraiva, and I'm the UN correspondent for Bloomberg News. You have no idea how exciting it is to see so many young faces in the building today. So let's start by giving yourselves a round of applause. Like I said, I'm so excited to welcome you in this chamber today, especially when there is such urgent need for brilliant, well-intended voices to be heard across the globe. The ECOSOC Youth Forum is happening in the context of multiple global challenges, from deadly conflicts to climate change to an urgent cost of living crisis. All of those are issues that impact young people. Many countries are still dealing with the aftermath of COVID-19. Others are grappling with climate events like never seen before. At the same time, the world is experiencing the highest number of violent conflicts since the Second World War, according to the UN itself. It's not an easy time to be growing up. It's not an easy time to be making choices. That's pretty discouraging, isn't it? Well, something tells me that if you consider this a lost war, you wouldn't be here today. So let me share a quick anecdote with you. The late Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano, one of my personal favorites, asked in one of his books what the point of utopia was. Utopia is on the horizon, he wrote. I approach two steps, it moves two steps. I walk 10 steps and the horizon runs 10 steps further. No matter how much I walk, I'll never reach it. So what good is utopia, Galeano asked. Well, it makes you walk. So that's my message for you today. We will not solve all of the world's issues in this room this week, but we can move closer to that. So let's use this week's Youth Forum for that, to walk toward utopia. With that in mind, let's get down to business. Um, I'll start with one rapid fire question for all of our panelists so that we can warm up and get to know each other. But before I do so, I'll quickly introduce them. Um, if you want to know more about them, like I said, it will be quick. And when a journalist says it's quick, it's actually quick. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to check their full bios, which I do encourage you to do, please go on the ECOSOC Youth Forum website, and you can check them there. So here with us today, we have Dr. Felipe Paulier, uh, who was named the first UN Assistant Secretary General for Youth Affairs last year. Before that, he served as the Director General of the National Youth Institute of Uruguay. He also served, served in various political management positions. He's a doctor by trade. Also here with us today, we have Umaima Maklouk from Morocco. Uh, she's a data scientist at Intel and has been mostly involved in tech-driven initiatives. For the past three years, she has helped to lead the annual UN Datathon, which she's gonna talk more about a global data science competition for students and data professionals to work on solutions to address global challenges. Also here today, we have Zainab Narabene from Mali. She's a telecommunications engineer with a passion for the environment. As head of the Sahelian Youth Climate Network in Mali, she implements concrete actions and participates in high-level international events like this one. <laughs> Finally, we have Justice Faith, from Canada. She is the co-founder of Revolutionaire, a platform that empowers young people worldwide to take action in their local communities. Currently, Justice is collaborating with UN Women on an initiative at the intersection of art and activism for gender equality and racial justice to launch in 2025. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Can I get a round of applause for our panelists too? Some of them traveled really far to be here today. 
Thank you for that. So like I said, I'm gonna start with one very brief question for all of you and maybe we can go from left to right. But one of the things that sometimes we ask ourselves is that yes, we do have many interesting conversations all the time, but how do, do we translate those into practical action? So that's my question for you. How do we translate the conversations and the ideas that are going to emerge from this forum into action once we go back to our countries, to our positions? Perfect. What an incredible question. So let's be real here. We come to these forums brimming with ideas, ready to tackle the world's greatest challenges as the Secretary General so brilliantly outlined earlier this morning. But let's be honest, it can feel easy, like we're shouting into the void, like our voices, no matter how loud, can't get past the periphery. But here's the thing, that's exactly why the United Nations ECOSOC Youth Forum matters. We need spaces like this to come together, strategize, and remind ourselves that we're not just token voices. We are the future, and our future is at stake. Therefore, this week, I'm so excited that we're building this movement of young people who are demanding change. But to your question, how do we take the energy of this room and turn it into action? The real change starts at home. We register to vote, and then we vote. We leverage every platform at our disposal from TikTok to town halls to make sure that our demands are heard. We organize local campaigns that tackle local issues that are aligned with the 2030 agenda. And to the politicians, hear this. You don't just get our votes, you earn them. Our votes are hard won and hinge on your unwavering commitment to safeguard our future. If you stand with us, if you fight with us, and if you work alongside us to forge a better future, then and only then will you get our support. So everyone, as we leave this forum this week, Let's take a clear message back to every corner of all of our communities. Change cannot wait. It demands active participation from each and every one of us and decisive action from our leaders. We will hold our leaders accountable, not simply because we can, but because we must, for our future, for our planet, and for generations to come. Thank you very much, Augusta, for that question. I will, of course, uh, speak in French. It is a pleasure for me to be here at this youth forum representing Malian youth, but also youth uh, from the Sahel on this panel because I also have my sister from Morocco here as well. So I thank you for raising such a crucial point because we must recognize that there are many forums and discussions but the problem is the follow-up afterwards, there is a huge number of ideas coming out of these uh, forums and that move on to high-level discussions, but then how do we translate those to concrete action? I think that in order to do this, we need to adopt a strategic approach and we need to start with communication. We need to speak about these resolutions emanating from this forum and we need to make sure that all stakeholders have access to this information. We are a minority here. We represent youth from around the world, but the youth of the world are not up to date on all of the resolutions coming out of these fora. And if that stays that way, we risk not seeing action at all levels. So we need to communicate these outcomes better. We must also establish very clear communication and collaboration channels between all stakeholders, and this means the youth, the international community, but also our leaders and decision makings. This is very important. In order to act, this communication and collaboration needs to be in place. And finally, we need to promote partnerships and instill a culture of accountability. This is essential in order to make sure that the momentum generated by this forum translates into meaningful change on the ground. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, Augusta. Thank you, President of ECOSOC. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists, and specifically thank you all for being here. Um, and 
to follow the tradition Augusta has installed about applauding, I would like to say that we should make, give an applause to all the people and the staff that have been working for this event to take part. And this is not something easy to coordinate. And they have put a lot of love in this work. So I will ask everyone to give an applause to the staff that have been working for this job. So this is my first ECOSOC Youth Forum since being appointed as Assistant Secretary General for Youth Affairs. Uh, and I have the, the honor and the responsibility to lead the newly established United Nations Youth Office. Um, and let me say that it's extremely powerful to see hundreds of young people from all over the world gathered together and joining this forum here in person, and thousands more than are joining us virtually, connected online. But maybe one reflection is that let's take into account in, in our participation during these days those that are not in this room. So those 1.9 billion young people that don't have the chance to be here. And let's feel ourselves committed Let's feel ourselves what we are in somehow that is privileged to be here. And let's take their perspectives into account and let's bring their diversity, their beautiful diversity also in our discussions. In how to follow up and to, and to, and to continue what happens during these days, I will say that on our side, for ones that have a responsibility to work in the UN, it's about how we bring these voices into the continuity of dialogues and decision making during the process. And how we advance in establishing more spaces such as this in other discussions in the UN. We have this year the Summit of the Future, and the third day of ECOSOP is going to be focused on the discussions and on the perspectives of young voices around the summit. So our commitment from the office is to bring this and to connect the dots along the whole process of the UN. And on, on what every one of us can do, I think it's to follow up on this conversation once we are home, once we return to our daily responsibilities, and how we can connect what is being discussed here with the decision makers at our national, regional, and, and other spaces where you are part of. So thank you. Um, well, I think, you know, we covered a lot of the items about how to engage further after the forum, and I'd like to emphasize maybe two actions that we as youth can take. Um, the first one is really to use the momentum to rally youth. You're going to get to engage and network with a lot of youth that come from diverse backgrounds and countries, so please take the time to connect with them and create potentially WhatsApp, Slack, whatever that is that you want, uh, groups where you can like have communications with them and maybe right after this forum you can um, set up a brainstorming session where you can discuss some of the ideas that you heard during the forum and you can choose one that you are truly passionate about and try to bring it into life. You know, that's how the UN Datathon came to life, that's how a lot of other initiatives came to life. You are the future of these um, ideas taken into life. The second key point is, you know, key documents coming out of this forum. Uh, so the youth constituency is, is going to be working on the voices uh, of youth reports, which will be a complement to the formal MGCY sectoral position paper to be prepared for the HLPF in July. So these are definitely, you know, some key documents to work on. So if you can contribute in that space as well, um, that's really, really great. So I, I hope this can inspire you. Thank you, everyone. That was truly inspiring. And I wanted to follow up on some of the things you said, but I, I, I want to start with you, Assistant Secretary General, because something that you mentioned called my attention. It's the fact that there are a lot of us here, and that's truly great, but not everyone is able to be here, right? And at the same time, just to bring back another data point that we talked about, the fact that right now in the world, we're seeing the highest number of conflicts, violent conflicts since the Second World War, right? So it's a discouraging moment to be young, right? So how do we keep young people engaged when this is sort of our new normal? 
So thank you, Augusta. First, I will say that we should change sometimes the narrative about young people and conflicts, no? So let's start for, by acknowledging the incredible and the important role young people have continued to play as promoters and as protectors of peace, especially in, in areas where we have an unimaginable impact of war, of conflict, and humanitarian catastrophes. So it is absolutely essential that as an international community, we continue to stand in solidarity with the millions of young people that are being impacted by violent conflict around the world. The Secretary General made his point very clear and what's the position of the UN across conflicts, ongoing conflicts. But yet, what, what the young people remind us, and I'm sure that during the conversations these days, is that there is another way. There could be another way. And we know that one nation cannot solve these challenges alone. But we do feel that there's an inability of world leaders to work together and putting our common future in the center. So I do feel that there is a lot of power in this room in how to change the narratives and how to change also the commitments from our global leaders on peace and on these issues. So the Secretary General did mention that with our office and with a lot of support of other partners, we are promoting and we have launched an advocacy campaign in the form of an open letter uh, from young people and allies calling for world leaders to take immediate action to make global policy making and decision making more representative to the communities they serve. So I invite you to join that conversation and on your capacity to replicate this message and to join it and to bring also your local, your national, your regional perspectives and your support on this advocacy tool. Because this year we have an opportunity about rebuilding trust, about restoring hope. The upcoming Summit of the Future is a crucial momentum for commitments for transformations on multilateralism. And in this world of ongoing global conflicts, multilateralism is more urgent and needed than ever. So young people are watching, young people are supporting, and young people are definitely the ones that need to take the lead to transform this scenario. So I'm hopeful also, and I think that this room is hope for a lot of us. Thank you so much. <laughs> Zainab, I will turn to you next because I want to ask you about another issue that has been very urgent, and it's one that you've been focused a lot on. And I wanted to ask you specific, uh, specifically about climate change. I know Mali, your home country, has experienced these days record high temperatures. And it's something, well, the high temperatures are something we're seeing there and some other neighboring countries, but I'm sure a lot of us here are seeing a, a change in our home countries. And this is something that has, on, uh, has us on edge. So I wanted to ask you how, a lot of us think of climate change as a problem of the, of the future, right? Yes, we have to act now, but so that things don't happen in the future. But when you are, in fact, seeing those things happen on the ground now, impacting your families, your country, how can we act now to stop this issue from becoming even worse? Merci, uh, Augusta. Thank you, Augusta. Climate change is devastating. Every day, it destroys, in our country and elsewhere, it, just, 
it sows destruction and it sows death everywhere. So to respond to that question, I would say that to address these deadly heat waves, which also create a security risk, it is imperative to be very proactive. Augusta has said this, Mali is currently experiencing record temperatures of approximately 50 degrees Celsius. I think for you, you would consider that unlivable and that's the case for us as well and it kills hundreds of people weekly. So this proactive action, as I was saying, could involve measures such as investment in resilient infrastructure, setting up early warning systems and emergency plans that are climate adapted, but also awareness raising among communities on uh, addressing risks related to climate change. And I will focus on awareness raising and education. I think that is what we need today. Many of us do not respond appropriately to the effects of climate change. And even these deaths that we have experienced Lately, many people are not aware that these are due to climate change. So we really need to raise awareness about this and to show each and every person and human being what their impact on the climate is and what actions that person can take to address climate change. So awareness raising and education in this area is very important. And I, ref I am referring primarily to education at the youngest level. At a certain age, it's difficult to change mentalities but when we start from the from a young age when we start from the beginning this will enable them tomorrow to act in a very responsible manner when it comes to our environments in addition to this we require increased international cooperation with stakeholders and partners this is important to build our population's capacities to mitigate the harmful impacts of climate change. And to conclude, I would also say that we need support and financing. Africa needs support and financing. The Sahel needs it and Mali needs it. I thank you. Merci. Thank you so much. I know so far this has been a very pessimistic panel, so I promise the next two questions will be about hope. <laughs> so Umaima, I wanted to ask you about something you are very suited to answer, which is technology. So a lot of us here grew up with technology. A lot of us here don't know a world without technology. I see a lot of people on their phones and computers here. Um, so I wanted to ask you, at the same time that for a lot of us, technology is so ingrained in who we are. We still see a lot of gaps when it comes to access to technology. So how can we leverage technology and how can we close some of those gaps to make sure our generation is making the best use of it? Yeah, thank you so much for asking this important question, Augusta. Um, I have to say, you know, despite the fact that 95% of us live close to regions where there should be access to internet, only 66% of us actually do have this access. You know, it's very critical to work together um, through a multi-stakeholder approach to be able to bridge this gap. And, you know, youth can actually do a lot in that space. First of all, because we're all very connected and also very involved in this topic. Like, you know, access to technology should be a universal right. And there are really, you know, I would say like maybe three scales at which we could engage. The first one is to advocate for equitable policies through lobbying local governments um, as well as institutions. And this can go through alliances such as the Edison Alliance, which is you know, a multi-stakeholder approach between the private sector, institutions, as well as the civil society, and helps um, basically bring uh, internet access to one billion people by 2025. So we need more of these initiatives and alliances. The second scale is you know, truly the most important one, it's partnerships with the industry. A lot of us work in tech or maybe we have relationships with tech and they are the ones who own these technologies and they are the ones who can actually design more affordable and inclusive technologies in the future, making, for, ex for example, subsidized um, laptops or like uh, um, accesses uh, to, to the internet 
to the internet that would be cheaper. And we really need to make sure that we're part of this shift. Um, and you know, I'm talking about, for example, an innovation called the fixed wireless access, which is using radio wavelengths to enable a broader network access. And we need to have more of these innovations. Like it should not be all about businesses. It should also be about leveraging tech and their power and their funding into designing newer, more accessible technologies. And lastly, and the easiest way for us as youth to engage is obviously at the community level. We can all volunteer one or two hours of our time, um, talk to our local government, see where there is a gap, uh, which zones in our countries need to have some training and education around technology. And there are a lot of nonprofit organizations such as Codex who goes into uh, war conflicted regions such as Gaza and Ukraine to teach people who are, you know, children who are now out of school to leverage those tools, to be able to get connected, get access to education and healthcare. So yeah, there are definitely a lot of ways in which youth can get involved, and I do encourage you to try to find ways in which you can involve, get involved, especially um, at the local level. Thank you, Augusta. Thank you. Okay, so hope is a word that has come up quite a bit this morning, and that's good because we need that to put things in practice. So Justice, I'll turn to you now, because you're someone who has worked in the private sector, you're someone who has worked with government, with NGOs, so you've met a lot of eager people along the way, a lot of people who had hope. So can you share some of the lessons you learned from some of those people? What gives you the most hope? Yes, well, what gives me the most hope is young people, just like all of us here today and those joining virtually. But in my work firsthand with young changemakers, I've been so privileged to witness the extraordinary courage and innovation of young activists, especially those who are tackling urgent global challenges head on. Their stories not only inspire, but also teach profound lessons in resilience, collaboration, and most importantly, the transformative power of collective action. One of my favorite stories to share is of a young environmentalist who I met. His name is Elijah and he embarked on a journey to the Arctic. There he conducted uh, studies on contamination levels and the impact of these contamination levels on indigenous communities. His story is a powerful reminder of how deeply personal and also scientifically rigorous activism can be, and also how crucial it is to intertwine our efforts with those directly affected by environmental issues. Then there are the inspiring young people who joined forces with my sister and me and corporations to feed 2,000 people in a single day. This example shines a light on the remarkable outcomes that can be achieved when we bridge the gap between grassroots initiatives and corporate capabilities, channeling vast resources into meaningful action. And of course, let's not forget the iconic vision of four million young people taking to the street during the climate, during the climate strikes and really, this massive mobilization illustrates the sheer force of youth united for a common purpose, proving that when we stand together, our actions can echo across the globe, and leaders will listen and take action. So from these narratives, the core lessons that I've learned is that no dream is too big. When you equip yourself with a community, knowledge, and take action with unwavering dedication, we often like to say that dreams fuel revolutions, and it's our commitment to learning, to fostering connections, and to persistent action that allows these dreams to be transformed into lasting change. So to all of you, as we stand here together today at the United Nations ECOSOC Youth Forum, let's embody this spirit, this idea as young people that we dream boldly, we learn eagerly, and we act fiercely. Together, we're not just dreamers, we are doers committed to taking action. We're not just hopeful, but we together are powerful. So with each step that we take, we're not just shaping a better world, we're actually building it. And let this be our message, our mission, and our legacy. Thank you. Assistant Secretary General, one of the issues that your office has been focusing on since it was founded last year is the current state of mental health among young people, right? We're a generation that grew up during a pandemic. A lot of us are entering the labor force for the first time in this post-pandemic world. A lot of us come from countries that still haven't recovered from the pandemic. So can you tell us a little bit more about what your office has been doing to address mental health and how and what kind of impact that has on our generation? 
Thank you, Augusta. I will change, switch to Spanish because it's my native language and I think that there are a lot of Spanish speakers in the room. Mm -hmm. And Augusta herself speaks very good Spanish because she was born in a city very close to my country back in Uruguay. And I think that's why she brought into the conversation Galeano also <laughs> as one of her favorite uh, writers. So, la salud mental. Mental health, the mental well-being is a, an especially key issue and a personal issue for myself as well. And perhaps a, it has to do with my uh, training and my personal training as a pediatrician. And furthermore, the opportunity that I had uh, to uh, work uh, heading the uh, national policy in my country with respect to youth, uh, uh, there the topic of uh, mental health uh, was something that came up in all of the conversations and all of the uh, spaces where we uh, listened to and worked with young people. And my experience as well at the level of the regional youth uh, platform in the uh, Ibero Ibero-American Youth uh, Organization, that was a, a theme that uh, came up constantly, a priority issue in many of the countries in the region. And um, uh, in the four and a half months that I've been here as the head of this office uh, with uh, the possibility of sharing with uh, young people from all regions around the world and having traveled uh, to places that are far from where we are, but uh, that are very close to the reality of many people. Uh, this uh, is a topic that comes up constantly, a topic uh, that emerges, emerges from intersectionality from those young people, conversations with those young people that are working on climate change, in topics with young people concerned about educational issues, uh, uh, the impact that this has. Uh, and uh, uh, when we talk about unemployment uh, and uh, the lack of access to employment, uh, which is 3.5 times greater for young people at the global level uh, than uh, among the general population. So these are all issues of concern to young people. Uh, one out of every seven uh, young people is experiencing uh, some kind of uh, condition linked to their state of mental health. And many times uh, these are not uh, diagnosed uh, and they're not uh, treated. But uh, unfortunately, the discussions uh, that we hear at the global level and the uh, discussion of the focus of uh, public policy on mental uh, health uh, uh, continues to be <clears throat> one of stigmatization. And it's important to have uh, these conversations openly. It's important to have uh, these conversations from a youth uh, perspective, because for uh, young people, uh, this uh, topic uh, is uh, no longer stigma. It's the young people that are pushing for a transformation at the national and regional level when it comes to this uh, area. Mental health uh, is uh, a necessary uh, condition, not only for life itself, but to develop ourselves and, and to fulfill ourselves freely. And uh, undoubtedly, it's a question which is uh, defined by many factors, and that's why it also requires an intersectoral discussion, a discussion which has to involve uh, communities, families, uh, s health uh, care systems, as well as responses that exist for young people. It has to involve education, and uh, especially uh, young people, young people being uh, partners and not necessarily the recipients of a policy. And. Uh, there, I believe that our office uh, has to uh, keep this issue among their priorities. We have to uh, push uh, for the system to create even more space for this. Uh, and um, I had the opportunity to uh, attend an exoc meeting in Chile, uh, especially on uh, inter intersectionality, the intersectionality of the new work, of uh, uh, new technology, and its uh, effect uh, on uh, well being. And our commitment to is to move forward so that uh, there are uh, commitments and uh, national policies, investments, uh, when it comes to uh, studying the pathology of uh, mental health and how to prevent mental health. 
uh, to move uh, as well in those uh, with those commitments uh, that there be more support and services uh, that are not stigmatized and that are reliable for young people and lastly and above all to involve uh, young people themselves in this dialogue uh, to involve young people as uh, protagonists uh, and as partners uh, not only to uh, promote this conversation but also uh, to uh, find the solutions that are needed thank you very much well, we We only have five minutes left, so let's see how far we can go. Um, but I did want to ask a question about gender equality, because like I said at the beginning, it's not as usual to see this many young people in the room, but it's also not as usual to see so many diverse faces, culturally, in terms of gender. So Umaima, I wanted to save this question for you because you're in the tech sector, which has always, has traditionally been a male dominated field and you're a rock star. So I wanted to ask you, what have you learned by working in the tech sector, by advancing the rights of women in that sector and what can we learn from that? Well, thank you so much, Augustine. Yes, I wanted to point out the fact that it's really amazing to see such a diverse um, you know, panel, of course, but also such a diverse presence of youth from all around the world. So thank you so much for coming, dedicating some time, and you know, big applause to all of you. Uh, with regards to the tech sector in particular, it's really crazy to think about the fact that only 26% of the workforce in the tech space is women, um, despite the fact that actually a little bit more than 30% of them go into engineering school, so some of them actually quit and go into other professions and kind of are afraid to go into the tech sector or find maybe something else. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's not just about fairness, it's also about actually unlocking the full potential of the tech workforce, driving economic growth and fostering innovation by having a diverse panel of people, regardless of their gender. That's really what should be put into perspective. Um, I think, you know, based on my little experience, there are multiple actions that we can take. Uh, first, we must confront biases and stereotypes and maybe have a blind recruiting process so that, you know, regardless of the gender, it's really based on merits and on experiences. Um, second, Obviously, companies must commit to equal pay, and there are countries like Iceland who have implemented back in 2017 the equal pay law, which uh, prevents companies from not being transparent about paying the east, same amount of money to someone doing the same job, regardless of their gender again. Third, we need more STEM education and mentorship programs. There are lots through universities and education. We need to do this early on and also confront social pressures in the global south where it's not important for women to go to school. And you know, I know we had a great intervention uh, about women in Afghanistan, and I think we really need, need to take this into account. We need to make sure that young girls want to go into tech, are not afraid to go into tech. It's not too hard. It's If they want to do it, they should go for it. And lastly, everyone should advocate for gender equality. I've seen a lot of men allies in my company, and that really makes a huge difference in advancing things. We are all equal, and we should all advocate for each other's rights, because that's you know, these are universal rights. So I hope that each one of you is inspired to work on this at your local scale, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it seems like I have 20 seconds left, so I will have to wrap this up. But I just wanted to tell you, uh, it seems like we were able to bring up a lot of interesting, a lot of important topics, and our panelists are going to be here, so definitely pick their brains. And I, I feel like if there's one message from this panel, it's that collaboration is key, there's still hope, and we have to translate the conversations and the ideas that come out of here into practice. So let's keep that in mind, and let's check back in a year from now to see how far we got, if we moved just a little bit closer to utopia. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank our distinguished speakers for their valuable insights that they've shared with us. And of course, I would like to thank our moderator for skillfully guiding this, uh, this discussion. And now we are going to wait just a few seconds for the President of the General Assembly to arrive. He's coming in. We're going to receive the President of the General Assembly with applause.
for you. <laughs> I now uh, invite to the forum to hear an address uh, by the president uh, of the 78th session of the General Assembly, His Excellency Dennis Francis. Madam President of the Economic and Social Council, Your Excellency Ambassador Paula Navarez, esteemed youth leaders, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to join you at the 2024 ECSOC Youth Forum. And it is humbling indeed to be the next speaker following this truly inspiring and dynamic uh, young leaders uh, meeting, bringing youth from all around the world. Today we are here to listen to your innovative ideas on how we can reinforce the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and work smarter to end the crushing scourge of poverty blighting our societies. My message to you is straightforward. We need your talents and your engagement. You are the future of multilateral cooperation no matter your discipline or your chosen course of study. Eradicating poverty, including extreme poverty, in all its forms and dimensions, is not only the greatest global challenge we face. It is an absolute requirement for delivering on the central transformative promise of the 2030 Agenda, to leave no one behind. As the abounding energy in this chamber makes clear, you, the world's 1.2 billion young people, are not simply waiting for change to happen. Young people today are taking action to solve the complex challenges affecting their communities and making a real difference. For example, young business leaders in West and Central Africa are boosting food security by using circular strategies in the areas of aquaculture and poultry farming. In China, Young entrepreneurs are building robots to clean polluted waters. In Bangladesh, they are empowering local communities through sustainable tourism. And in Kuwait, Fatima Alizela found Ecostar, a nonprofit that recycles trash from homes, restaurants, and schools. One of many young people across the region who are leading the way to a more sustainable future. As president of the General Assembly, I am not only committed to working with young people to promote sustainable development, I am committed to learning from them. You are here at a pivotal moment this year's Youth Forum is coinciding with the General Assembly's first ever Sustainability Week, which I am convening here at the United Nations headquarters. Our aim, to supercharge action across the 2030 agenda by promoting sustainability across all activities of the global economy. Tomorrow, April 17th, 
as part of Sustainability Week, I will be hosting an interactive Ask PGA conversation with youth. I am eager to hear directly from young people about where we are going wrong, what we are getting right, and how we can elevate the ideas of young people to shape the sustainability conversation. I'm also challenging everyone to join our Choose Sustainability campaign, to be loud and proud on social media about the actions that you are taking to create an inclusive, equitable, and sustainable future for all. I repeat, for all. We recognize that young people are already living with the consequences of our action and our inaction. The ideas you generate in the ECOSOC Youth Forum will keep us accountable as we prepare for the pivotal event on the UN calendar, the Summit of the Future in September. Its anticipated outcome, the pact of the future, is a pact between the generations. And young people are actively engaging in this process to ensure that it is inclusive and representative. Together with a global digital compact and a declaration on future generations, all three of these documents will represent a formidable investment in young people and define our shared future for decades to come. We are indeed at a moment of breathtaking change. We need your determined leadership and your vision more than ever as we work towards a future that is more safe more just, and more sustainable for all. I wish you a productive two days and very much look forward to hearing the fulsome harvest of your important discussions. I thank you. I thank the President of the General Assembly for his statement. And the forum will now hold a spotlight session entitled Youth in a World Without Poverty. And I would like to warmly welcome our distinguished speakers. Okay. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Yi Jun Mok, young leader of Generation 17 of the United Nations uh, Development Program.
He's also here. Okay. So So I now um, give the floor. Here? So I'm the calling. So I'm going to present them. So I'm the calling. So I'm speaking personally. What's your name? Por favor. Yes. Okay, can, can, can Marlet come up? Marlet! Okay. I do apologize for those difficulties with the right of show. Uh, Her Excellency, Paula Nevais, President of the Economic and Social Council, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and most importantly, my fellow youth, attending in person, lighting in virtually, and everywhere you are. Let me start with a question. What is the opposite of poverty? If the first words to come to your mind were wealth or abundance, you wouldn't be wrong. But wealth and poverty are two extremes, and the World Bank rightly points out that multidimensional poverty goes beyond monetary poverty and should account for access to education as well as basic infrastructure. In this vein, the eradication of poverty is not simply about making everyone rich. The opposite of poverty is the dignity of a meaningful life, the ability to meet your needs and those of your loved ones with hard work and your own two hands. The heart of this dignity is to complementary interlocking enablers, education and employment. A quality education provides you with the skills and knowledge you need to thrive while decent work and employment give you self-sufficiency and a pathway to contribute to society. But we often think of the two as separate, education in the classroom, employment in the workforce. Separating the two ignores the reality that opportunity is not evenly distributed. But by bridging the gap in the transition from school to the workforce, we can help to break the cycle of multidimensional poverty. First, we can do this by building formal and informal support networks within communities. To help young people transition into the workforce and thrive, mentorship can be invaluable. Advisory Singapore, the charity that I run, we operate Singapore's largest careers-based mentorship, allowing any young person to apply to be matched one-to-one -one with a mentor in their field of interest. And we've delivered over 14,000 hours of mentorship since 2020. Such formal and informal networks can play a big role in closing the opportunity gap that young people face. Second, we can do this by bringing schools and companies the realms of education and employment closer together. Through the Advisory Educators Roundtable, a platform that we run with the National University of Singapore and Deloitte, we create spaces for teachers from high school and up to learn about industry trends and engage with industry professionals to inform how they prepare their students to transition to the working world. Teachers who are every day on the education front line must be supported in understanding what companies need in the workforce and companies likewise must appreciate the educational context in which they hire. By closing the gap between education and employment, we can help to ensure that every young person, regardless of the background they come from, has a fair shot at building a meaningful life. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yijun Mok. Generation 17 Young Leader. We will now hear from Ms. Malet Reddy, who is a member of the Global Youth Caucus for Decent Jobs and Sustainable Economies of the Major Group for Children and Youth. Standing here today, I'm fueled by a vision where youth like us lead the way in ending poverty. My advocacy has brought me to platforms like Horlet Bank Yosemite to high-level political forum to representing African Union diaspora youth in initiative 
and at the policy forum development where I teamed up with youth representative to shape and recommend policies. I believe initiative led by us use our catalyst for innovation, inclusivity in policy making. Through working in grassroots calls, partnership with governments, NGOs, international organizations, decision, decision and policy makers, we can amplify our impact and create last, lasting change. Let me share my personal story as an example of poverty, close to my heart, period poverty. Many girls and women around the world miss school and daily duties because of this poverty. They resort to unsafe methods to manage their poverty, worsening their situation. Let me ask you a question. How, <coughs> when was the last time, when is the last time you heard a young girl using a cow dung, ash, dry grass, and socks in 2024 as our period product? Period poverty hinders women from participating in efforts to reduce poverty. If we address this issue, we make significant step towards a better future for all. When I learned about the solvable poverty, I created a campaign called I Care, collaborated with Jagnit Campaign to develop a solution, the Birkay Dignity Bucket, partnering with local manufacturers like Ade. We have helped hundreds of thousands of women with sustainable period products. We weren't just providing products, we were empowering young girls to stay in a school and break the cycle of poverty. And women to engage in fully, fully in solving poverty and introducing eco-friendly solutions. Solving period poverty is not, doesn't need a magic, but a, but a holistic approach and collective efforts. If a few of us can make such a difference, imagine what we all can achieve together. Through Birke, we have engaged stakeholders, catalyzed actions, and we aim to reach one million girls by 2030. Yes, the cycle of poverty is stubborn. It might feel like we are scooping water from the ocean with fork, but trust me, we will fill the bucket. I finalize my speech by highlighting youth engagement is not a buzzword. It's necessity. You're not alone. We are united in this fight. Let's advocate for investment in youth and gender-focused programs, make inclusive decisions and use technology and innovation for, um, to empower marginalized youth. Together, we can create a world where poverty is just a thing in the past. Thank you for your attention. I thank the member of the Global Youth Caucus for Decent Jobs and Sustainable Economies of the Major Group for Children and Youth. Um, uh, we are now going to briefly pause the meeting uh, to allow the podium to be rearranged uh, for the uh, session on Progressing from Poverty to Prosperity, Youth as Agents of Change. And I would ask you to remain seated, please, while we uh, reorganize uh, the meeting.
Yes. Can I? Can I go? Oh. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I'll do that. Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna start. Can I? You ready? El foro in. The forum will now begin its session entitled. Uh, um, please take your seats. The session entitled Progressing from Poverty to Prosperity, Youth as Agents of Change. And it is my pleasure to welcome the following distinguished speakers. I would, I would ask for your attention, please, and, and please take your seats. Yes, the session is going to begin. I would ask you to be seated. Ms. Francine Pickup, Deputy Assistant Administrator and Deputy Director of the Bureau for Policy and Program Support of the United Nations Development Program, who will deliver opening remarks. Mr. Elliot Harris Reyes, Head of International Community Programs in Latin America at Citibank, Mexico. Ms. Benedicte Mundele Cuvuna, Founder and uh, Manager of Surprise Tropical, Ms. Uh, Munji Nachinga, Member of the African Youth Commission and of the Commonwealth Youth Human Rights and Democracy Network, Mr. Abubakar Sadiq Myakel, Co founder of the ILEM, Ms. Asami Segundo, Aikiland Youth Leader from the Philippines, and uh, Ms. Lopa. Banerji, Director of uh, the Civil Society Division of UN Women, who will deliver the closing remarks. And I would also like to uh, welcome the moderators, Ms. Uh, Sophia Fei Yachen, a global focal point uh, of the Global Youth Caucus for Decent Jobs and Sustainable Economies of the Major Group for Children and Youth, and uh, Mr. Murilo Fragoso Slomka de Oliveira, founder of the Blossom Project of Walter Wells for Africa. And I will now invite the moderators to conduct the discussion. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the first thematic session on SDG1. Uh, je m'appelle Sofia. Um, My name is Sofia. It's an honor to be your co-moderator here today. My name is Murilo. I'm an education activist from Brazil. This is my first time at the ECOSOC uh, Youth Forum. Uh, it's my pleasure to moderate this session with Sofia. A warm welcome to everyone. So let's invite Francine Pickup to start with the opening remarks. Your Excellencies, dear young leaders, Ladies and gentlemen, it's really wonderful to see the UN so full of young people this week and to see this chamber also full of young people. And it's absolutely that hope and energy that you all represent and that you bring that we need right now for achieving the sustainable development goals, particularly goal one around uh, eradicating poverty. Uh, it was actually not long ago, I think last week, that uh, the Human Development Report that UNDP uh, launched uh, said that while development is, is strong and uh, progress is being made, there is more inequality between countries than we've seen before, and the, f the poorest and most vulnerable are being left behind and young people are disproportionately affected by that. Addressing shared global challenges that we have today, like climate change, like pandemics, like inequality, requires collective action. And you as young people need to be at the center of that collective action, and you need to have a seat at the table of decision-making. Young people, particularly those uh, from marginalized and unrepresented groups, are facing multiple challenges. 
And women and girls uh, are also more impacted than most uh, and at, at increased risks of, of poverty. But amidst all these challenges that we face, there is resilience. And at UNDP, we really believe that young people, when we work with young people, it's not just about demographics, it's not just about numbers. You really represent the talent, ideas, skills, and rights to sustainable development. We are really committed to looking at innovative ways that we can engage you in a meaningful way in decision-making processes for change. One example that I wanted to share with you is how we invest in Africa's youth and the support to the flagship interventions that can make the African Continental Free Trade Agreement work for Africa's young people to help them grow their businesses. This is translated into support to over 10,000 uh, young entrepreneurs across the African continent. You, the young people in this room, have so much potential, and you've proved that your skills, experience, and in innovative ideas are crucial to solving today's complex problems. Policymakers, practitioners, young delegates, we need to take advantage of these three days to share knowledge, build partnerships, and develop sustainable solutions to address poverty, especially in fragile and crisis contexts. At UNDP, we will continue to work through initiatives and programs like Generation 17 to turn the tide on poverty and create a world where young people are empowered to reach your full potential. I look forward to hearing more about the work that goes on over these next three days and the recommendations that come out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francine. So now it's time. So now it's time for a video from the UNDP. So that was a brief introduction to the subject, the topics of our panel. Um, so let's start with, so I have a few questions. I'm start with Benedict um, from the Democra De Democratic Republic of Congo, fong founder and manager of Sunrise Tropical. So we'd like to learn more about your initiative and what you've done in the past few years. Hello everyone, I'm from Democratic Republic of Congo and I'm an entrepreneur since 2014 and I've been working with uh, creating a solution that reduces food poverty and I'm also in Kuvuna Foundation where we are 
uh, creating a new generation of leader and entrepreneur by organizing a lot of activity that we are empowering youth and entrepreneur in Congo. All right, so we'll start with um, the first questions um, for Asami and Apple Vakar. So both of them um, work very hard on amplifying youth voices and building resilience for per per poverty reduction. So Asami, with your deep-rooted connection to the Carabao mountain range and your expertise in environment, how can, you, how can your community's practices be leveraged to strengthen resilience and amplify the voices of youth and indigenous populations, especially during times of crises. Could you provide a few examples of initiatives that have effective, um, effectively combined traditional knowledge and modern technology to achieve these goals? Thank you for that question. Before I answer them, I would like to, I. I would like to express how honored I am to be part of the ECOSOC Youth Forum 2024, and I would like to thank UNDP for allowing me to share my indigenous community story. In a study by the World Bank, 80% of the world's biodiversity sits in indigenous territories, which just shows how IPs or indigenous peoples have been stewards and guardians of the world's ecosystems. When we talk about biodiversity, we don't just mean to say forests, trees, and wildlife. Biodiversity includes food, ecosystem, ecosystem services, and medicines. My community, the Ikalahan community of the Philippines, has been taking care of almost 60,000 hectares of land and forest for generations. We use our indigenous knowledge to manage our land and resources. This indigenous knowledge and practices has allowed us to thrive for centuries. And in our mountain village, our indigenous knowledge allowed us to still have water, even in the midst of heat waves and El Nino, El Nino, which is happening right now, even at this very hour in the Philippines. Our shifting cultivation of practices have fed us when we were not allowed to trade because of the lockdown due to the, due to the pandemic. Our medicinal plants have helped us alleviate the COVID symptoms when, we, when COVID entered our village. In all these practices, indigenous youth, youth are always included to ensure the continuity and knowledge exchange. To amplify the voices of youth, our elders have supported the initiatives of indigenous youth to combine indigenous knowledge with more modern technology in order to document and ensure effective land and forest management. You see, indigenous knowledge and practices has a lot to offer, not just for us IPs, but to the world and to the coming generation. And in order for us to protect indigenous knowledge, we, the next generation, must ensure that the rights of indigenous peoples, including indigenous youth, are upheld and protected. Let us work hand in hand to ensure that holders of indigenous knowledge and wisdoms are respected. With regards to the examples of initiatives that have effectively combined traditional knowledge and modern technology, in my community, we have began the programmatic intergenerational dialogue wherein the youth, the indigenous youth, and our elders would share our knowledge together and see how we can effectively transfer knowledge from the elder generation to the younger generation. Also, all over the Philippines, we have a lot of indigenous youth who are using GIS or geo-infographic system and 3D modeling to help their communities in their um, land use planning. In Bali, we have seen indigenous youth using digital means in order to protect and to document their indigenous knowledge. So those are the practices that I can share. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So Abu Bakar, drawing from your experiences as the founder of the language learning app, AILEM, um, could you explain to us how we can utilize technology and educational innovations to strengthen resilience of refugee communities and amplify the voices of young people? Could you share a few examples where such approaches have provided significant access to information and resources contributing to community empowerment and poverty ed eradication? Thank you. Firstly, I want to start by saying that I'm incredibly lucky to be here at this event. And this is because of the opportunities that were given to me, whether it was a scholarship, support from a foundation, or the mere access to education and internet. And I'm only one of 108.4 million people who are forcibly displaced and are stateless. 
and we all share the commonality of language as a key factor to integration, labor market, and continuation into further le uh, learning. LM focuses on language, and we believe there are key intersection of language and fluency with poverty and opportunities. Education coupled with the use of simple technologies like mobile phone and apps can reach those in need and masses in at a larger scale. We strive to empower communities with skills and knowledge through education tailored for them. Moreover, by providing education to refugees, we can help them uplift themselves out of poverty. And this is especially true when we can see a prominent difference between refugees of first and second generation. The majority of refugees, unfortunately, do not get to finish their higher education, which leads to further economic, economic disparities in poverty. By providing them with the tools and resources they need, we can give them an equal chance as everyone else of succeeding. And our prime example is working with refugees in Zalika refugee camp in Malawi. We, we work with our refugee coordinator on the ground in order to consult them on what infrastructure is needed. And uh, by working uh, with those on the ground, we ensure our resources are put into impactful technologies that can help and empower uh, refugee and asylum seeker communities. Another aspect of our work is our ethos, created by refugees for refugees. For example, throughout the app creation journey, every content and feature was made by consultation with the refugee and asylum seeker community. Beside this, we hold uh, local cultural events in order to facilitate cultural and linguistic exchange between refugees in their local community and also hear their feedback regarding our services. This allows us to truly tailor our uh, services and platform to our demographic. And finally, I want to leave you with a few key messages. Find the courage within yourself to understand and know the life challenges and struggles of refugees and asylum seekers, from leaving their home to arriving to a new country. Give refugees and asylum seekers opportunities, a second chance, a chance to start a new life. And um, you'll find that even the smallest of actions can be life changing for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please know that we're also honored to have you here, Abu Bakar. So now it's time for the second part of the panel. So um, Elliot, um, with your leadership as a leader in international community um, at City, how could the corporate sector collaborate with governments and civil society to empower youth in poverty eradication? Could you share a few examples of successful corporate-led initiatives that include youth? Thank you. No, thank you. No, and it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, empowering young people from a corporate lens is of very high interest. You know? So not only is it important to contribute to sustainable development, but it also is very much aligned to fulfill business uh, goals and business strategies. Some of these could be talent development, you know, philanthropy initiatives, as well as employee engagement, three things that all these stakeholders that were mentioned in the question are, are really interested about, no? So I guess coming together as a group is where the corporate uh, strengths are. Um, City and the City Foundation, no, has a wonderful program called Pathways to Progress, where it's been running for a decade now, and one of the most successful programs we have is in partnership with the UNDP, no? Youth Code Lab. This program is, uh, has touched over uh, uh, 10,000 uh, employees working at City that also pitched in and gave mentorships to young people. It's focused on young people and giving them the skills to develop their own entrepreneur and social entrepreneurship. Uh, it's also a very important uh, part of, uh, of, of uh, the largest Asian project that we've ever done from a private perspective at City. It's in 28 countries, uh, and, and, and it's also one of the most successful models that precisely emphasizes on that model of bringing government, private sector, and, um, and, and the rest of the stakeholders involved in order to be very productive when, when, when it comes to helping youth develop these skills for the, for the uh, global workforce that we're working on. Thank you so much for your insightful response. Um, so, um, so talking about partnership, we also have Mwinji here, who is a law practitioner and human rights advocate. So my question for you is, what broader legal and policy changes are necessary to enhance the involvement of youth, especially young women, in social economic development and the eradication of poverty in Africa and beyond? 
Um, thank you so much, and it's such an honor to be here at the ECOSOC Youth Forum, and thank you so much for this opportunity to just join so many you know, young leaders from across the world. So um, it can't be overemphasized the importance that policy and law obviously play in the attainment of the sustainable development goals, because if you don't have the right policies and right law in, in place, it's, it's almost impossible for us to then even speak about implementation and attainment of the SDGs. I will highlight, obviously, a few policy changes that you know, can be made um, so as to ensure that um, we have socioeconomic development and poverty eradication. Firstly, obviously, we need to look at you know, youth-focused education policies. Um, governments obviously must ensure that you know, education systems are reformed so as to make them more responsive, not only to the labor market, but also um, giving skills, entrepreneurship skills to, to young people. Um, secondly, we, we need to look at employment and entrepreneurship policies, um, ensuring that we have policies in, in place that um, create platforms for job creation for young people, obviously, to be employed and given skills for employment, so for example, internships, and not just internships, but paid internships for, for young people. Because so many times we see young people being provided with internships, but internships which, which do not pay. We also need to ensure that there are gender responsive policies, policies that ensure that young people, for example, um, in, in African countries, um, are allowed as young women, young people and young women are allowed to, to take part um, in different uh, developmental issues. Also, I think uh, a major issue is on access to financing. I think most times young people do not really have access to financing. And in, in such an instance, what, we, what I would recommend is that there must be deliberate policies uh, by governments and private sectors that provide for a certain percentage of funds that are set aside for entrepreneurship to be given to, to young people. For example, in Zambia, where I come from, we have what's called the Citizens Economic Empowerment Commission, which provides financing to entrepreneurs. And so it's essential that when you have such policies in place, there is a certain percentage that's deliberately for young people and, and young women. Yeah. Okay, so now, um, you have one minute, but we'd like to know um, how can platforms such as the African Youth Commission could be used to forge stronger, more effective collaborations among different, different actors? Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Um, obviously, for example, for the African Youth Commission, the LYC, I think the LYC obviously can, can provide capacity building for young people, being able to, you know, um, capacitate young people, giving them the necessary skills, skills that they need, and obviously providing a platform for engagement, obviously with um, the governments, so young people being able to, to engage the governments and bridge the gap that's between young people, obviously, and, and, and governments. Oh, um, another thing is innovation. I think when it comes to innovation and technology, the AYC obviously can come into um, such platforms and provide um, a, a meaningful platform for young people to be able to pick skills and knowledge on, on innovation. Thank you. So talking about meaningfulness, we'll go back to Elliot to wrap it up. So how, what kind of strategies that are meaningful would you recommend to align corporate investment and services with poverty reduction goals ensuring the inclusion of youth, women, and the most vulnerable communities. You also have one minute. Thank you. Yes, so first I would say that it's very important to start the design of any program or project with the community, no? With these vulnerable, either youth, or women, or different vulnerable communities, you have to have them in the center, bring them to the same table with everyone who's investing, bring them to the same table, at the design stage and throughout the whole process, no? Secondly, I would say that we have to leverage the private sector's role also and capacity, no? Uh, get their investors involved, clients, the volunteer uh, employees, government relations, everyone at the company has to also pitch in. And of course, lastly, they should definitely invest and commit, no? You have to have the right partners to do this 
And we at City have found that partner in many of our projects and are really glad to showcase uh, some of them with UNDP that have been very successful. So I guess at the end, it's engaging with stakeholders, especially with the community leaders and the community that you will be, uh, be, be in receiving all the added value from these programs and stick together throughout it. No, that's how Pathways to Progress was able to go on for a decade now with over $300 million investing to prepare uh, uh, programs to prepare a uh, workforce and create jobs. Thank you all for sharing your insights. They are truly enlightening. Uh, they resonate a lot with me as a young leader myself. I co-founded a nonprofit two years ago with my friend Renata called it Blossom Project, which aims to democratize access to mental health for the most vulnerable, especially teens. Um, we help them build skills that allow them to meaningfully connect to others, to learn how to take care of themselves, and to cultivate healthy, lasting relationship with friends, family, and those around them. Mental well-being and social capital are not the first thing that come to mind when we think about breaking the cycle of multidimensional poverty. But I, believe in taking care, but I believe in taking care of each other, of working together through education, policy, and beyond to ignite the hope in the eyes of our youth. <coughs> we, want to, uh, we want to not only treat the symptoms, but tackle the roots of poverty. Um, and now I heard that the ministers are doing exactly that, and I wish I could have the opportunity to talk with my minister uh, in my country when I first started out. Unfortunately, Brazil is not here today, but let's hear from those who honored us with their presence today. Uh, first up, Her Excellency uh, Ms. Florencia Taboada, Evrinov, Minister of Youth from, from Paraguay. You have two minutes, and then we'll cut off the microphone. Hello. Okay. Good morning to everyone. Uh, as the youngest, as the youngest minister in Paraguay, I have a deep commitment with the public policies relating the youth and poverty reduction. Within the government of Paraguay, we have joined efforts with other sectors to set more ambitious goals in the areas of education, employment, healthcare, and other key factors that are that affects directly to the youth. The National Secretary of Youth, as an institution with a social mission, is constantly working in projects regarding microeconomic actions with every member of the social cabinet. The biggest project right now is the National Plan for Poverty Reduction that is, led, that is being led by our President Santiago Peña. Our scholarship programs grants valuable youth by giving vulnerable youth by giving the chance to over 5,000 students per year to fulfill the, their professional careers. Additionally, we are working closely with the Ministry of Labor to guarantee better possibilities to access a formal employment. Moreover, for the first time, we have designed an innovative and exclusive program for university students with the objective to promote financial inclusion by means of banking tools based on direct and indirect expenses for students during their university cycle as an approach to reduce the education, educational dropout gap by dealing with the critical barriers such as transportation, gas, food, student material, materials, among others. As well, we are addressing the aspects of healthcare. Since prevention is key, we are developing a specific in integral youth health care plan in collaboration with the private sector alongside the public health system. These and other initiatives are promoting, we are promoting within the government of Paraguay So from now on, um, in order to make sure that speakers do not exceed two minutes, I'm going to show the, the paper so the speaker knows when time is going to be over. Uh, thank you, Her Excellency, for your insights. And now, um,
Now let's invite Her Excellency Zulmit Rivera, Minister of the National Institute for Youth from Honduras. Buenos dias. Uh, good morning. Uh, for us, uh, being uh, young in the current world is more than a stage in life. It's a historic responsibility. In a context of global challenges and uh, rapid transformations, young people are the driving force for the transformation of our peoples. We are the engine of innovation, social justice, and sustainable development. However, we must be aware of the, uh, the tough challenges that our uh, nations face, especially in Latin America, and which directly, of course, affect our young people. Uh, today, despite uh, the difficulties uh, in Honduras and despite the uh, great uh, destruction uh, that we uh, saw in uh, public institutions and uh, the um, state finances, uh, the government of uh, President Castro uh, made the largest uh, public investment uh, uh, in the history of Honduras uh, based on the uh, um, uh, development of public works, as well as investing in the most impoverished sectors of the, the society of Honduras. And, uh, of the 65% of poverty in our country, a third of them are young people. The government began an aggressive program to rebuild uh, schools in thousands of uh, educational centers in the country. We're also developing a uh, program of uh, for uh, sc school meals, which is globally recognized with a coverage of more than a million of boys and girls at the national level. And we've d devoted funds and programs uh, to provide thousands of uh, scholarships uh, for all educational levels. Um, and especially in the um, graduate and postgraduate level. We have many challenges. We uh, welcome the effort made by the United Nations uh, through, their, uh, through its General Assembly in creating the Summit of the Future to tackle the uh, global problems uh, through uh, multilateralism and international cooperation, uh, peace and intergenerational dialogue, uh, uh, sustainable development. Uh, And now, I would like to invite His Excellency Mohamed Orman Bangura, Minister of Youth Affairs from Sierra Leone. Let's, let's move on for the next one. Um, His Excellency Rafael Feliz Garcia, Minister of Youth from Dominican Republic. No. Um, so See, now. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. okay from the best country in the world. Progresando de la pobreza a la prosperidad. Well, uh, going from uh, um, poverty to prosperity, we as uh, uh, agents of change, a title that uh, invites us to ask the question. And uh, first of all, we have to think as uh, young people, and secondly, as activists, uh, and then as public servants. Uh, on if we uh, are really placing young people at the center of public policies, uh, not only referring to implementation, but also its formulation. And uh, precisely from that point of view, that innovative uh, perspective, uh, we have to look at the question. We're uh, simply, uh, if we simply do something that uh, out of protocol, or are we actually empowering our governments, uh, uh, giving them uh, the category uh, that they uh, deserve as Ministry of State, uh, placing young people at that level, giving them the necessary resources, uh, and with this, uh, setting aside uh, the uh, attitude of some adults which affected uh, the generations of young people throughout humanity. But with this premise, uh, we will begin our action in the Ministry of uh, Youth uh, a couple of years ago, uh, making sure that uh, all of the public policies uh, that are are uh, formulated by the Ministry of Youth is for young people and by young people. Public policies that uh, truly aim uh, to make those realities more visible uh, among the uh, youth of the Dominican Republic, living this multidimensional poverty, which uh, uh, we work on each of the uh, needs in the area of education, health, uh, 
business with educational support, which uh, seems to mitigate uh, these uh, social problems among young people, um, uh, assisting uh, young people who are vulnerable, uh, young people with uh, disabilities, uh, young people, uh, young single mothers, young artists. To move on with the next person. Thank you, His Excellency. Now, like, uh, next speaker, um, I'd like to invite His Excellency Mohamed Orman Bangura, uh, Minister of Youth Affairs from Sierra Leone again. And development partners. Today we convene under the auspicious of a critical theme that is centered to global development and peace. Progressing from poverty to prosperity, youth as agents of change. The session is pivotal in highlighting the urgent need for targeting intervention to address multidimensional poverty, particularly through empowering our young people as catalysts for sustainable change. In Sierra Leone, our commitment to eradicate poverty through youth empowerment has been both steadfast and strategic. Recognizing the challenges outlined in the United Nations Secretary General's report on youth, peace, and security, we have endeavored to transform these challenges into opportunities for our youth. Our efforts align with the global mandate to amplify youth participation in political, economic, and social sphere as essential to achieving these sustainable development goals. The multidimensional aspect of poverty encompasses not just economic uh, deprivation, but also the lack of access to education, healthcare, and decent work. In Sierra Leone, we have taken significant steps to mitigate this by integrating youth centers policies that focus on education, skills development, entrepreneurship, and initiative that design not just to uplift the youth from poverty, but also to harness the actualize their potential by participating stakeholders in national development. The National Youth Service, National Youth Commission, policies like radical inclusion that stand for including, making, giving opportunity to every young person. The youth face numerous obstacles ranging from inadequate access to Thank you, thank you. Um, now I'd like to invite Her Excellency Barbara, um, Minister of Tourism and Hospitality Industry from Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, youth are not just the leaders of tomorrow, they are change makers of today. Their energy, innovation, and passion are driving forces behind our collective journey towards prosperity is guided by our vision 2030 aimed at becoming an upper middle income society by 2030. We recognize the immense potential within our youth population and are committed to harnessing it for sustainable development. To this end, the government of Zimbabwe is implementing various initiatives aimed at empowering our youth and providing them with the tools they need to succeed. From skills training programs to the entrepreneurship support schemes, we are investing in our youth uh, to unlock their potential. I'm pleased to share that the theme of our di uh, discussion towards aligns with the focus of our theme for our National Youth Day that we commemorated on the 21st of February 2024, which we focused on unlocking socioeconomic potential for the youth through building uh, the capacity of the young people. We are implementing various youth empowerment initiatives and one such initiative is the Youth Empowerment Fund, which provides financial assistance to youth, to young entrepreneurs to start or expand their businesses. Additionally, we have established vocational training centers across the country to equip our youth with necessary skills for the modern economy. We understand the progress requires collective action, including partnership and collaboration between the government, civil. Uh, thank you, Her Excellency, for your statements. Now let's invite His Ex Excellency Ahmed Mohamed Hissen, Minister of Youth and Sport from 
Iraq. In the name of God, the merciful, Iraq emerged victorious in its war against terrorism by dealing a defeat to ISIS. However, terrorism has created thousands of displaced persons and orphans and destroyed infrastructure, particularly in the northern and western provinces of Iraq. That coincided with the launch of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda of the United Nations. Iraq has made major progress in implementing the 2030 Agenda, particularly in the area of poverty reduction. According to UN indicators, as well as those of its bodies working in Iraq, we've made remarkable progress, particularly as part of the Ministry for Youth and Sports. This ministry has surveyed 15,000 young men and women. 62% were unemployed. That is why we launched a national vision for youth. One of the pillars of this vision is, on, is focused on eradicating poverty, hunger, and seeks to provide decent employment for youth. And this vision also seeks to develop the sectors of education, health care, and other sectors that are important for employment. We call for preserving the key values of our civilization, as well as creating an environment favorable for youth employment. Regrettably, youth in Palestine and the Gaza Strip are subjected to indiscriminate attacks by the Israeli occupation forces. We must promote human rights without distinction, particularly for youth. We are committed to the implementation of all programs. Now let's invite uh, Her Excellency Francisca Gallegos, uh, Vice Minister of Social Services from Chile. Tardes. In Chile, for more than a decade, we've been experiencing more than intense, intense political uh, movements. Uh, uh, the uh, social mobilization has been a constant actor in public life. Let us recall the student movement of the year 2011 and uh, movements to defend the environment, which came in uh, subsequent years, the so-called feminist wave of 2018, or the uh, mobilizations of 2019. At the political level, the country has uh, experienced an important reconfiguration where new political expressions not only have appeared in public space, but also have reached important uh, powerful positions. Uh, the common denominator of all these processes has been the young uh, Chileans. Uh, one generation after another, they've overcome obstacles, d defended rights, and placed social justice at the center of public discourse. Uh, furthermore, uh, Chile today would not be possible uh, if it wasn't uh, uh, for the active participation of young people in this period. An example of this is the important progress that we've seen in gender equality and respect for sexual diversity, uh, agenda, an agenda which uh, Chilean uh, women have placed at the center of their activity and uh, has changed their society. We know, however, that there's still uh, major uh, gaps to overcome, and we have to find more prosperity for young people. For example, we see as an important uh, uh, challenge uh, uh, more active uh, participation uh, and linking youth uh, uh, to decision-making processes. Uh, even though, as we saw earlier, the, uh, uh, there's a, a desire to participate socially, this does not lead uh, to the concrete possibility of uh, expressing uh, opinions in at the decision-making level. Um, uh, another, uh, there's an important challenge when it comes to uh, uh, caregiving. A uh, large percentage of uh, women who say that they do not work or study, uh, what they actually do is provide work as caregivers. Uh, they work, but uh, they are not paid. Uh, this is a problem which uh, directly affects uh, the uh, prospects for economic prosperity for young people. Uh, tackling the situation is crucial uh, because uh, today we have to uh, prevent uh, the reproduction of this, these unjust patterns. See for your thoughts. And now I'd like to invite Her Excellency Zumit Rivera, Minister of the National Institute for Youth from Honduras. I don't think so. Um, let's move on to 
His Excellency Chumnias Serei, Secretary of State, Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports from Cambodia. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, youth development is an important agenda of the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sport and the Sovereign Mandate of the Royal Government of Cambodia. We have provide our young people with opportunity to unlock their potential and to get access to education, career development, decent work, especially to become national and global citizens. Automation and AI are changing in the current world. They affect it greatly on youth and the future work. That's why we have implemented a number of youth development programs to equip youth with 21st century skills, including digital knowledge. With the theme this year, our stakeholders shall, shall work to increase the role of youth in community building, promote youth participation, and engagement in community to development. Train them to the capacity and role of youth in addressing social challenge and intensify interaction among youth for positive change. We must invest, we, we must invest more in, on platform that allow youth competition, youth volunteer, youth entrepreneurship, and youth development. This youth development project will allow youth to become a gen of change who is capable of driving progress and innovation for a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, His Excellency, for sharing your insights. Now I invite Special Advisor to the Minister for Youth and Sport from Indonesia. Hello. Okay. Madam President, we stand at a crucial moment where the voices and actions of youth are vital for the world's future. Youth are not just impacted by poverty, they are crucial in ending it. Empowering youth means ending poverty. Madam President, as the country with a large young people population, Indonesia experiences this reality daily. Indonesia has about 64 million youth aged 16 to 30%, which makes about 23% of our total population. Based on this experience, let me emphasize three ways to empower youth to end poverty. First, we must create an enabling environment to foster youth creativity and leadership. By engaging the youth, Indonesia has witnessed how they drive innovations and solutions. We have integrated youth initiatives into Indonesia's leadership in the G20, ASEAN, and MIGTA Forum over the past two years. And we will continue this at the upcoming World Water Forum. Second, we must actively invest in youth education and empowerment programs. Youth should be equipped to make meaningful contributions to poverty eradication, which involves integrating youth empowerment into development plans. Indonesia has mainstreamed this into our forthcoming long-term development plans for the year 2024 till 2045. Furthermore, the upcoming Pact of the Future must reflect the needs of youth empowerment and poverty eradication. We must make the most of this ongoing ne negotiation and take it as a golden opportunity. Madam President, Indonesia's commitment to making youth agents of change is unwavering. I thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Alia. Now, uh, next up, the next speaker is His Excellency Hassan Mohamed, uh, a representative from Egypt. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, moderator. And, and Egypt is very pleased to participate in the deliberations of the forum and very uh, enlightened to hear the, uh, the different views and the vibrancy of the participants uh, in, this, in this meeting. Uh, in light of the time, we'll share a few remarks, and uh, particularly that the current uh, figures and trends indicate that poverty is on the rise for the first time in 20 years. And, uh, and as the Secretary General of the United Nations puts it, poverty is a moral indictment of, of our times. Uh, last year, 120 million people fell into poverty uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic and, and further exacerbating inequalities across, across the globe. Uh, nationally, this has been one of our major goals through our national project, Haya Karima, to uproot uh, thousands of people from uh, poverty and ensure their participation, most notably, of course, youth. 
what we see is necessary is uh, enhanced global action uh, through global solidarity in areas of job creation, education, research, and, and innovation, and bridging the digital divides. Uh, and this has been a major pillar in our national strategy for, for youth, uh, ensuring that youth are active members of their society and capitalizing on the uh, immense benefit they, they bring to their societies. Uh, finally, the increasing debt burdens that developing countries face do place uh, additional restrictions on, on the resources needed for, uh, uh, for, for sustainable growth and development and the realization of, of human rights. Uh, it is noteworthy that, that the African continent pays more on education and health, uh, I, I apologize, pays more on debt servicing than on education and health care. And so, uh, thus uh, the resources have become increasingly limited to ensure that youth are empowered and are able to fully participate. Uh, we hope global, through this forum, uh, global action could be enhanced and increased, and we look forward to the outcomes of the discussions today and in the coming two days. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's invite um, Sarah al Mashihari, representative from Yemen. You met the Shabab. Youth are an important part of our social fabric and are expected to make up 69% of our population by 2025. Yemen capitalizes on this segment of society as the war waged by the terrorist Houthi militias rages, rages on. The Yemeni government, represented by the Ministry of Youth and Sports, took effective measures to elaborate and implement a national strategy with the broad participation of youth and CSOs to build youth capacities in different areas, including education and entrepreneurship. Youth-led projects can effect positive change in different areas uh, towards a building a country. The Yemeni government underscores the importance of empowering and integrating Yemeni youth as agents of change. We see this as a real investment in building the present and future of next generations. We also seek to build the capacities of youth in tackling current and future challenges, including rampant poverty, unemployment, and lack of economic opportunities, which put them at an economic and social disadvantage compared to their peers in the region and the world. We also uh, stood up, we also stand up to the Houthi militias that seek to undermine education and spread ignorance through their systematic practices that aim uh, to radicalize our econ education curricula, which will weaken our social fabric, a pillar of social development and growth. In this context, we call on the international community to support the government's efforts. We call for uh, support for education and development, and uh, the microphone was cut off. Thank you so much. Now let's invite uh, Mr. Mikola Popadiuk, a youth delegate from Ukraine. Uh, the issue of poverty has been challenging for Ukraine even before the full-scale Russian invasion. It has only worsened during these times. Even if the unemployment rate falls contrary to the aggressor's intentions, this is not enough. Ukrainian youth holds excellent power today, but with great power comes great responsibility. So we have the knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm to become the driving force of change. But is the world community ready to take responsibility for supporting us in this? We are not just victims of war. We also are change makers and we call youth worldwide to unite with us. We are only as strong as we are united, as weak as we are divided. Dear participants, uh, today Ukraine, as a victim of Russian aggression, is being destroyed every day. And uh, the issues of our economical development and recovery is, uh, matter, is our matter of national survival. Involving youth in the processes of recovery and development is a good way to change our approaches and to create something new for us. Now Ukraine is a place where the new practices and ideas are uh, implement, uh, 
are tested and the best approaches are implemented. So now we are starting to build new wide uh, network of managers for our recovery of young leaders who will be providers and developers of our new economy. We are asking you to help us because from the beginning we are open for international cooperations, for exchange of experience and ideas. By helping us to rebuild our country, you are helping us to survive. By helping us to survive, you are helping to preserve our common future, our freedom and our democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Bo, for sharing your insights. Uh, now let's invite His Excellency Lok Bahadur Tapa, permanent representative from Nepal. Critical partners in development, progress, and prosperity. They are the ones who can lead to sustainable future for all. Yet we remain concerned over continued poverty, hunger, unemployment among youths. We need to take some measures to support youth development and to leverage their strengths and potential by grooming the youth and women in leadership position, including political decision making, by imparting training and capacity building, by utilizing and knowledge and skills of the youths, particularly returning migrants, by engaging and providing that, uh, them with financial and employment opportunities, by maximizing the digital platform for the youths, lastly, by investing in the youth to harness their full potential, which is absolutely necessary. Madam Chair, we are proud that Nepal has the youngest populations with 63% uh, of the youth. We are having to capitalize on this demogra demographic dividend for our prosperity. We give due importance to the overall development of the youth and their contribution to the development. And we have framed uh, youth visions, adopted the youth policy, and established the youth council. Nepal has seen 42% of the youth participation in the local level governance. Lastly, yes, we are working on the declaration for future generations. Let us place to keep the youths at the center for peaceful, inclusive, and uh, just societies. Let's ensure that youths are not left behind. Rather, they work as an agent of change for a prosperous future for all. Thank you. Thank you, His Excellency. Now let's welcome Her Excellency Alicia Guadalupe Buenrostro Massieu, Deputy Permanent Representative from Mexico. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you. It's crucial to acknowledge the crucial role that is played by young people in uh, transforming our socioeconomic reality. Uh, frequently, adolescents and young people face social shortcomings and the lack of access to social security is one of the most prevalent ones. Furthermore, limited access to income is, continues to be a significant obstacle in order to overcome a multidimensional poverty that they face. And hence, we need to urgently take concrete action to guarantee their well-being and comprehensive development to place young people at the very core of public policies that uh, address these shortcomings as well as poverty, my country has implemented the National Youth Plan 2021-2024, which aims to provide young people with tools to improve their development. Our program, Young People Building the Future, offers uh, free uh, business training to unemployed youth. Likewise, the uh, pro, the Young Trade Program uh, trains young entrepreneurs. Uh, these programs are vital in order to promote the, socio uh, the socio social and economic inclusion of young people. Uh, furthermore, the youth perspective has become a fundamental framework to guarantee their rights uh, and uh, to guarantee their active participation in society. Mexico acknowledges the crucial role that is played by young people in uh, driving inclusive and sustainable development. Uh, investing in education, training, and empowerment. Uh, uh, not only are we ensuring the prosperous future uh, for youth, uh, but we're also accelerating the economic and social progress of the entire country. Uh, 
And that is why it's crucial to continue to work in uh, collaboration with uh, young people. Thank you much, Her Excellency. And thank you all so much for delivering your statements. Your remarks allows us to better understand the work you do in your country. So right now is a long-awaited moment where young people can um, intervene. So, um, appuyez sur le bouton devant votre... Please press the button in front of your microphone. Um, in order to intervene. So, those on the balcony, there is a designated seat. Um, so, we will um, have um, Ziad here. So, he will see the order in which people have um, pushed their button and we will be able to proceed this way. Um, and you will have a maximum of two minutes. All right. Do, do we have anyone? Okay. All right, so we'll start with the young person. Um, in the reserve seat, in the balcony. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm really honored to be here. And I just want to say that as we discuss achieving Agenda 2030, it's important that we um, focus on things that actually you can push us forward. And a lot of discussions have been around education and workforce, but we've also not really focused on the things that inhibit people from being able to participate in these things. And one of this is period poverty. We cannot successfully eradicate poverty without solving period poverty. It affects education of girls and women. It affects their contribution to workforce. It also affects their health and meaningful living. So if we must work on a sustainable solution, we must work on a sustainable solution to end period poverty. I would like to propose that we implement price ceilings for period products so that people who are at the lowest part of the um, employment chain can also be able to afford these products. We also have to um, implement tampon tax. A lot of countries say in paper that they have implemented tamp and removed tampon tax, but we know that this removal has not been passed on to the end users, which are the customers. So I urge all state uh, members here to ensure that they have policies that make sure that these tax tampon, um, tampon tax removals have been implemented in countries. We must protect girls and women to ensure that we have a world that is free of poverty, and this includes ending period poverty. So the next one is seat 1471, Indigenous Youth Leadership Coalition. Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, as I'm someone working in the power industry, and my observation is that young people are increasingly a vital force in implementing the new renewable energy across the globe. When talking about clean energy technologies, the first thing that comes to mind is usually its role in emissions reduction and environmental protection. Its contribution to poverty alleviation is often underestimated. Clean energy is a fundamental tool for us to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. At my company, which is Power China, young people are leading efforts in technological innovation, technology training and transfer, and volunteering activities to improve lives. Like after we built the Lower Kafu Gorge Dam in Zambia, young engineers there started a hydropower training school that has already trained 332 local employees, uh, engineers, significantly improved their skills for a better future. So I hope that uh, more investment is um, um, concentrated in this area to promote uh, clean energy development so that more young people can be involved in this process. Thank you. The next statement will be 1479 from Youth Leader Senegal. Alors, bonjour. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I prefer to speak in French. My name is Ngaïa. I am an AI engineer from Senegal. I work in the telecommunications sector. It is a great pleasure to be here today. And in my statement, I want to focus on a point that seems essential to me, which is the urgency of setting up communities and creating ecosystems so that youth can learn, share, and apply their knowledge. I want, in this spirit, to share a recent experience in Senegal. We organized, we had presidential elections, and during the electoral campaign period, we youth mobilized to share our knowledge of artificial intelligence and new technologies in order to propose a technological solution that allows citizens on a large scale to have access to the candidates' platforms. And I think this is the kind of citizen engagement that youth must support and create more of. But there's also an obstacle to youth motivations to set up such solutions, and that is access to knowledge. So I think it is urgent, once again, to create an ecosystem that allows youth to access this knowledge. Today, we have a very uh, important and relevant debate that uh, around artificial intelligence and what it is replacing. So it is important to adapt and again, create these ecosystems promoting youth engagement that I've spoken of. Thank you. Merci beaucoup pour cette... Thank you very much for that statement. Next one up is RCO Merico. 1369. Hola, mi nombre es Hello, I'm Ixilib Cortez. I'm from the uh, indigenous uh, group, and I think it's important to, to say that uh, we are talking here about uh, participation, inclusion, uh, but uh, sometimes we forget to talk about justice because even though we know that uh, inequality is the origin of many of the crises that we are experiencing at the present time, it didn't start today. It's been going on for 500 years uh, with uh, the legacy of uh, colonialism and the looting of territories. Uh, that has meant that uh, uh, the 1% uh, pollutes more than the 90% poorest in the planet. Uh, and we know who are responsible for this. And uh, often there are people who are here, governments, industries, those are, those are the ones that we want to cooperate with, but at the same time, they're the ones who have uh, most uh, ruined our territories. And it's time for young people to demand justice, justice for our ancestors, justice for the future, uh, to put an end to inequality, to ask those who are responsible uh, to uh, assume responsibility for this, uh, because the alternative is, is happening at the local level. And uh, some people think that uh, autonomy and uh, the creation of alternatives among peoples is not suitable for those who are working at a global level where we cannot necessarily uh, see all of those difficulties that people are experiencing. We have to strengthen things at the community level. We have to strengthen the resistance of people. And that means that uh, those who are responsible for this looting, they must also assume responsibility for it. Uh, let's create justice for young people. Uh, for uh, uh, America, but also Palestine and those who live in a situation of war. We demand justice as young people, and let's do this for Mother Earth, uh, for our planet, and for the future. Muchas gracias, señora. Uh, thank you. Um, the next one up is 1353, the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In our quest for pro progress and inc inclusivity, it's imperative that we expand our horizons and provide more seats at the table. We are here all together, and we need seats and space for voices to be heard. As we address the challenges of today and tomorrow, we must recognize the indispensable for roles of youth in shaping our collective future. Our energy, creativity, and fresh perspective are vital assets as we navigate complex issues. I'm looking forward to making meaningful contributions toward youth empowerment and sustainable development together, while pushing for greater inclusion and empowerment closer to home. So I hope all of us here and each and every one of us is getting heard at this youth forum. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that was our last intervention from the floor. So um, we we'll invite Lo uh, Ms. Lopa Banerjee, the Director of the Civil Society Division from UN Women to deliver the closing remarks.
Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this vibrant, valuable, and strategic discussion. It is my great pleasure to be here on behalf of UN Women, and I thank all the wonderful young activists, the member states, the UN agencies, and all of you who have made this very, very important discussion possible, the first of two days, but also the first of an ongoing journey. As we conclude this uh, first day of the ECOSOC Youth Forum, young people in this forum, but also in the preparation to it, have underscored the urgency of this goal, SDG 1 the complexities it entails, and the innovative and intersectional approaches required to address it comprehensively. We heard from this panel about the importance of centering indigenous youth voices and indigenous knowledge. We heard in this moment of ex accelerating an intractable conflict, the importance of centering refugee knowledge and experience. We heard about the importance of policy and law-based interventions. Young people spoke about period poverty, renewable energy. All of this is focused on substantial investment in, uh, in gender responsive poverty eradication policies, social protection, public services, sustainable infrastructure, and absolutely the care economy. In the recently concluded uh, Commission on the Status of Women at 68th session, more than 8,000 young people shared their recommendations on how to in end gender gendered poverty and Finan increase financing for gender-responsive poverty-based solu poverty solutions. And we heard repeatedly in the preparation for this, but also for at CSW, the importance of diverse youth representation, including their representation and contribution to assessing equitable financial and institutional reforms. We have been hearing through this morning the importance of empowering young people as catalysts. Friends, the current global financial system is falling short and we need the reforms at this point in time that will allow for uh, the, the critical dialogues that are necessary to ensure that fiscal policies are inclusive and equitable and how we can have young people defining those. At, at, at this moment, but through all of the work going forward into uh, the uh, summit of the future and beyond, and into Beijing plus 30, the importance of youth engagement, intergenerational dialogue such as this space, and the importance of multi-stakeholder engagement to strengthen accountability. All of this conversation is invalid if we are not able to strengthen the accountability of the various and important solutions and recommendations that we are hearing from young people. So that not only are the strategies that they are offering robust, but that we as policymakers are able to develop the policies that resonate with all those who will inherit those policy outcomes. On behalf of UN Women, we will continue to create the spaces that champion youth leadership and that center stage youth influence in policy making. And finally, as we move into uh, the, the conference in Nairobi, the Pact for the Future, the Summit of the Future, and Beijing Plus 30, we will stand shoulder to shoulder with all of the young leaders who are determining not just their future, but the future of this planet for all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Luma, so much. 
uh, for your closing speech. Now it's time to wrap up our session. Thank you everyone for staying with us. In this plenary session, we highlighted the urgent need for adopted interventions to address the root causes of poverty. We were delighted to learn more about ways to empower young people so they can actively engage in the co-creation of solutions along with diverse partners. Through knowledge sharing with policymakers, practitioners, and youth advocates, just like um, we did today, I believe that the, cha that the challenges, opportunities, and tools we mentioned will foster new avenues for multilateral collaboration looking ahead. So before we end um, with uh, Madame la Présidente, with your, your message, we'll go um, to each and every panelist for one last sentence of key message that you want to leave with everyone here today. So we're gonna be, go, go, go in order. So we're, we're gonna do Winji, Benedict, um, Elliot, and then Abu Bakar, and then Asami, and then the President. Um, thank you very much. So um, essentially, um, legal and policy changes will require a holistic approach and collaboration among governments, civil society organizations, development partners, private sector entities, and youth um, representatives. By addressing these areas, countries in Africa and around the world can create an enabling environment that empowers youth, particularly young women, to actively participate and contribute to social economic development and eradicate poverty. Thank you. Thank you. So one sentence per person. Thank you. Collaboration and partnership among these entities can provide a comprehensive approach to tackling poverty. Government can implement policies and offer resources. The UN can offer guidance and coordination. Civil society can add advocate for marginalized group, academy institution can conduct research and provide expertise, and private sector can bring innovation and investment. So it's important to collaborate among all entities so we can eradicate poverty to, on youth. So to all the young people present, I would just like to hope that you leave this forum in a few days inspired, just like I'm leaving inspired now, inspired by all the work that everyone is doing. And from a public and private perspective, I definitely would uh, say that there is no small activity or no small program that we can participate in. So I'm really calling to action anyone who wants to do something for their community. And that would be probably the best result we could get when everyone gets home. So best of luck and success when you go home. With all this, I hope we can work together to support the learning and integration of refugees and asylum seekers. On this panel, I can see the inspirational stories and work that all of us do. Let's leverage the use of technology to empower our communities in refugees. And feel free to contact us if you're interested in collaboration. We're very open to working together for the betterment of refugees and asylum seekers. Thank you. There is no denying that our planet is, a, is at risk. We have the climate crisis and the expo exponential biodiversity loss. If we want to continue to see biodiversity in our immediate future and not see the perils of climate change, we must ensure that the rights of indigenous peoples, including indigenous youth, are recognized, upheld, and protected. We have reached the end of the discussion on uh, progressing from uh, poverty to prosperity, youth as agents of change. I thank the moderators for skillfully guiding our discussion. I would also like to thank the distinguished panelists for their presentations and delegations for their participation and contributions. Before adjourning this meeting, I would like to remind participants that the forum will reconvene this afternoon in this chamber for a spotlight session entitled Youth and Peaceful and Inclusive Societies, which will be followed by the session entitled Engaging Youth in Building Peaceful and Inclusive Societies. Also, I would like to invite you to visit the side events taking place from 1 to 3 p.m. on the margins of the forum. The meeting is adjourned.